The Senate has intervened in the ongoing industrial action embarked upon by the joint health sector unions in a bid to end the strike and make the nation's hospitals functional again. According to a statement from the Senate President's spokesperson, Dr. Bukala Saraki has met with the leadership of Johesu, as well as the Minister of Health, Professor Isaac Adewale, and that of Labour, Dr. Chris Singige, to hear the different sides of the issue. At the meeting with the Johesu leadership, the Senate President pledged that the upper chamber will ensure that the right thing is done to end the strike. He noted that it's not in the interest of the country to have its hospitals closed and pledged that the Senate would work with all stakeholders to ensure the strike is called off. On assumption of office, President Muhammad Buhari promised that tackling insecurity will be one of his priorities. The security challenges have since extended beyond the Boko Haram insurgency to other violent crimes such as cattle rustling, farmer herders clashes, banditry and kidnapping. In continuation of our review of three years of the Buhari administration, our correspondent Amaka Ukafo examines the security situation in the country. According to the Nigerian Watch Organization, over 14,000 people have lost their lives because of violent crimes in Nigeria in 2018 alone. The cause of this worrisome development is not far-fetched. Nigeria continues to witness spikes in violent crimes, including insurgency, famine headers clashes across the country, as well as the issues of cattle rustling in Kebi, Katina, and Zamfara State, living behind destruction of property, distraught families, and displaced persons. Although the military in the last one year has insisted that the Boko Haram insurgents have been decimated, suicide bomb attacks have continued in the northeast. In a repeat of the Chibok abduction, the terrorist attacked and seized over 100 schoolgirls in the Dapchi area of Yobe State on the 5th of February 2018. Unlike in the case of the Chibok schoolgirls, where some are still missing four years after the incident, the Dapchi schoolgirls were returned by the sex members to the delight of the villagers through negotiation by the federal government, except for one of the schoolgirls, Leah Shwaibu, who is still with the Boko Haram sect, even though the government insists it is on top of the situation. And as Nigerians grapple with the effect of terrorism and communal clashes, one of the deadliest cases of armed robbery in recent times took place in Ofa, Kwara State. Armed robbers invaded five banks, leaving dead many bank customers and police officers. In all of these, the federal government says it has taken several measures to curtail the security challenges. The federal government has deployed over 3,000 personnel of Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps, special forces known as agro rangers, to protect farms and agricultural investment in the country. The federal government has also approved 10 billion naira for the rehabilitation of communities affected by these violent attacks. But not everyone agrees that that is enough. It's very multifaceted. To deal with those problems, we have to deal with what are those things that make people commit crime. We have to deal with those issues. And dealing with those issues now comes down to issue of governance. You know, how do we provide for the people? How do we create an enabling environment where people can seek employment and gain employment and get themselves busy to the point that they will not have the time to go and commit crime. Even though President Muhammadu Buhari promised that insecurity will be nipped in the bud during his administration, many Nigerians believe that more needs to be done if this promise is to be fulfilled. Amaka Ukafo, Channel Television News. Let's discuss this a bit more now. Joining me live from Abuja is a lecturer, Center for Conflict Management and Peace Studies, University of Jos, Dr. Chris Kwaja. Thanks for joining us on the News at 10. Thank you very much, Amaka. It's a drama, but that's fine. Now, tackling insecurity... Oh, it's a drama. 
That's fine. Tackling insecurity, as we see, was a key feature of this government's campaign three years ago. How do you assess the situation? Uh, just to say quickly that I'm with the Center for Peace and Security Studies, Modi Badaba University of Technology, Yola. Okay. Uh, in terms of the security threats we are dealing with in this, in this country, I want to just categorize them into three. The first is the backlash in terms of some of the transnational crimes that we are seeing, mm -hmm. down from the Sahel to the Lake Chad Basin. We are dealing with the Islamic State of West Africa, holding Mali, Burkina Faso siege. We are dealing with Boko Haram that is holding Niger, Chad, Cameroon, and Nigeria siege. We are dealing with localized violence and other forms of deadly attack in terms of the current conflict between farmers and herders. But I will be quick to also say that there is a need for us to appreciate the fact that in the context of what is happening in the central Nigerian area and other parts of the country, that there are two strands of violence we are witnessing. Mm. The first is the usual conflict between farmers and herders over access to and use of natural resources, land and water. The second component, which is the most frightening and devastating, is this whole question of organized crime, banditry, deadly attacks against communities that are defenseless, which the Nigerian government through the security agencies are increasingly confronting. But the most fundamental question is also about whether since assumption of office, the present administration has been able to put in place what we can call a security policy for this country. Yes, and that's the question. Beyond the security to policy. Yeah. Continue. Hello? Please continue. Yeah, beyond the security policy, we also expect a peace plan. Because the situation we have today is that under the guise of responding to security threat, we have, we have militarized the public space. Nigerians are becoming more traumatized because on a daily basis, the first set of individuals they come, they, they come in contact with are military men that are armed. Mm. The, the police are a bit far from the citizens. That on its own is very prob problematic, which requires the government, Nigerians, to sit down and we require, or we need a situation today in this country where government will galvanize what I call a national support so is around that, um, this so issue. So if I can just ask... Unfortunately... If, if I can just ask, is that what you mean? Is that what is... Um, when, when analysts say we need something like a new security architecture, is that what they're talking about? Yeah, part of... Yeah, we need, we, we need a new security architecture. But before posing the question as to whether we need a new security act architecture, the biggest question is, do we have a security architecture? What does it look like? What is the level of coordination amongst all the security agencies? A very good example here is, for instance, Nigeria shares border with countries that speak French. We don't have any English-speaking country. What kind of security strategy do we have in engaging this country? That on its own raises very serious questions about the kind of foreign policy initiative or plans we have with our neighbors. Because a lot of the security threats we are talking about today are transnational. Recently, the president talked about the fall of Gaddafi and how it's linked to the, the role of mercenaries in, 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 in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. That it's something that the new security architecture need to respond to, to say in the context of the prevailing security threats we are having or we are confronting, how do we begin to put in place building blocks to ensure that we address this issue? The second layer is, what kind of soft approach do we need to? Which now brings in the question of governance. You need a leadership that has the capacity to manage diversity in this country. Oh. Because a lot of the issues we are dealing with today are backlashes 
right. of our inability to manage diversity. All right, and because you. we have not been able to manage diversity, we are dealing with a whole lot of problems around a political elite that is more interested in election or that are more interested in election than the future of this country, than the stability of this country. All right, but thank where you, you yes. have elites yes. that are concerned, that have the, 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 the buy-in of Nigerians in terms of the kind of strategies, the kind of responses that need to be put in place, right, it doctor. will make things easier for the security agencies that are out there trying to stabilize the country. All right, Dr. Chris Kwaja, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us on the news at 10 tonight. Thank you. The existing disparity in the salary structure of public servants appears to be a source of worry to the head of service, Mrs. Winifred Oyota. To address the risks, Mrs. Oyota says there is an urgent need to increase wages of civil servants who work in the ministries, departments and agencies of government. According to her, about 80,000 civil servants who mainly work in the ministries are affected by the poor salary structure. She was speaking at a forum for permanent secretaries and directors in Abuja. It is on the shoulder of this core service that the entire public service and governance re re lies. Now, this core civil service of about 80,000 people are the people you see whose salaries are extremely poor. Extremely, extremely poor. You could see that in the public service, uh, what, what an average... Uh, um, public servant on level 16, for example, earns is two and a half times what the civil servant, a director in the ministry earns. The disparity between the public servants, that's the parastatals, and the civil servants, that's the ministries, is so, is so wide, it's unbelievable. Now, these 80,000 people are the core civil service that really need attention. And we, have, we are looking into this.